This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. I'm Stephen Metcalf, and this is the Slate Culture Gap Fest. Why Zone of Interest is Dividing Critics Edition. It's Wednesday, February 7th, 2024. On today's show, we continue our march to the Oscars with two films. First, Zone of Interest tells the story of the Holocaust from an entirely new, to my knowledge, perspective, from the point of view of the psychotically, quote unquote, normal family life of one of its very worst perpetrators, the Commandant of Auschwitz. Uh, the film is courtesy of writer-director Jonathan Glazer and stars the estimable Sandra Hewler. It's up for Best Picture, Best Forum, and many other statues. And then the kind of sort of biopic Nyad tells the maybe true story of Diana Nyad, the distant swimmer who in her early 60s attempted what no one had kind of sort of ever done. <laughs> We're going to get to it. That is swimming from Cuba to Florida. This much is true. It stars Annette Benning as Diane and I, Jodie Foster as her friend and coach. Both have been nominated for Oscars. Benning for Best uh, Actress, Foster for Best Supporting. And finally, directing. How utterly defining of any movie or play. And yet, what a strange and subtle art it really is. I mean, there are sort of no two stable definitions that reinforce one another about exactly what a director does and when what we mean when we say something is well directed. Luckily, we are joined today by Isaac Butler to help us sort that through and all the other topics. Isaac, welcome back to the show. It is so good to be here, Stephen. It's fun to be face to face. You are the author, of course, of The Method, How the 20th Century Learned to Act, a history of method acting and acting in general in the 20th century. A really, really, really good nonfiction book. Thank you. It has stayed with me. I hear you are working on another book. Yes, I am currently neck deep in my next book, which is called The Perfect Moment, The Religious Right, American Art, and the Dawn of the Culture Wars. It is about the previous culture war from 1986-ish to 2000. It tells the story of how the religious right and American art sort of went to battle over what the purpose of art is, what free expression is, the politics of grievance, and whether or not the National Endowment for the Arts was going to survive. And of course, Dan Coyce is uh, the author of the novel Vintage Contemporaries and two or three other nonfiction books. He's also just sort of renaissance man of Slate, writer, editor, and podcaster. Dan, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Isaac. That's so cute that you're working on a new book. I finished a new book, and it's coming out in September. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was about to say, you know, while Steven was doing that intro, did you happen to write one to three new books? Uh, I'm working on some stuff, yeah. I've got an, a new novel, Hampton Heights, coming out in September. It's an adventure story set in Milwaukee in 1987. All right, there you go. Well, the banality of evil is the famous phrase from Hannah Arendt, the um, philosopher. She was a, a Jewish em- German emigre who studied uh, Adolf Eichmann up close Eichmann was among, if not himself, the greatest mass murderer in history. And what she was surprised to find is he was just a petty bureaucrat. When she finally saw him up close uh, on on trial in Israel, she said, how could a monster look this boring? How could he look this normal? And so she came up with that enduring phrase, not uncontroversial, but enduring phrase. The Zone of Interest is the new movie from Jonathan Glazer. He of Sexy Beast and Under the Skin Renown. And it's an attempt to fathom really the fullest depths of both banality and evil. By asking what was the quote-unquote ordinary home life, it's based on the real-life commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Haas, who lived just 
beyond the walls of the death camp he oversaw in a simple but decidedly bourgeois home filled with family, friends, servants, children, and even a little faithful dog. The movie details day after day of pretending one doesn't live in and amidst death, death that you are causing, murder to be precise, <laughs> genocide. The film stars Christian Friedel as Haas and Sandra Huller as his wife. It's based on a novel, very loosely based, I should say, on a novel by Martin Amos. Okay, the movie is in German. Clips are challenging when that's the case. Also, all the clips are horrifying to listen to, which I'm sure we'll we'll talk about. I know. I mean, the score of the film is so utterly menacing and ominous is really an extraordinary score. We wanted to share some audio. So here's a clip from the trailer of the commandant's wife, Hedvig, played by Hewlers, showing her mother around the garden with Auschwitz just over the fence. Let's let's have a listen. <laughs> Isaac, let me start with you. I, I've only personally visited one of the camp Sachsenhausen, which only at the very end of the war became a death camp. And we had this extraordinary tour guide who was a PhD student at Cambridge who was studying the Holocaust quite close, closely and the banality of evil, exactly who who was complicit, probably didn't feel as though they were complicit at the time. And one of the things he emphasized over and over again, he said, actually, aren't those houses over there outside the camp really as interesting as anything inside the camp? I never forgot that. And here's an entire movie about that. And in fact, you never really enter the camp. I mean, you might argue that there are tiny little highly abstract snippets that take place inside the walls of Auschwitz, but not not really. It's really virtually entirely within the enclosure of this um, bourgeois home. We are going to get to the fact that this movie has divided critics. I don't want to start there. I'm going to start with your reaction to this extraordinary film. Yeah. I mean, well, I think we should say for listeners who haven't seen the movie, yeah. it's sort of two movies at the same time. There's a movie you're watching and a movie you're listening to. And they, it's like a palimpsest, right? There's like a hidden movie underneath it. And that hidden movie is what's going on in the camps. And I actually interviewed the sound designer, Johnny Byrne, for working. And he spent a year with actors and and rigging up concrete walls and researching and all this stuff to try to as realistically as possible create what the sounds of the camp would have been like from their home. Like he went down to figuring out where certain things happened and measuring the distance to the house and then placing a microphone at exactly that distance. I mean, he went real, real deep into it and it shows in the movie, or I guess it, it sounds in the movie. I thought it was fucking extraordinary. I mean, I felt beaten up by it. It is it has really stayed with me. I found it incredibly affecting. It is unbelievably upsetting. It's filled with really indelible images. But the other thing cuz I know we're going to talk about what makes for good directing or whatever is that 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 I just kept marveling at was Glazer's absolute command of every aspect of cinematic storytelling. So, for example, the the film is mostly shot with hidden cameras. That And the actors are just kind of doing their thing and not knowing how they're going to be shot. And there's the, that leads to these very odd things. Like there's a moment where Haas is locking up his house at night. And every time he crosses the transom to a room, they, have, they cut to another camera right as he steps over. And so it looks like he's being followed by CCTV footage. You know, there's this wild voyeuristic thing that's going on. Uh, it's filled with indelible sequences. I, I thought it was amazing. Now, I will say that in arguing about it with people, I think people expect the movie to be mounting an argument about fascism or about Nazism. Which it does, by the way. But It does, but that was not my experience of it. My experience of it was that it had given me this kind of profound and disgusting experience of what that was like. And given that there's, you know, we live in an age where we are all complicit in a variety of evils because of global capitalism, I thought it was just really, really powerful. Dan, I think you've done something that neither Isaac nor I have. You've actually read the Amos book, Martin Amos book that this uh, film is based on. Uh, my understanding is that it's really substantially different. It takes the premise and the historical basis of the novel and turns it into a very different work of art. It's Sam Adams, a wonderful phrase, he sort of defictionalizes, Glazer does, what Amos fictionalized. You would not call this a plot-driven 
film. Talk a little bit about the novel and the film that came from it and also what your experience uh, of the film was. Yeah, so Amos's no- novel, which we talked about on, on the Martin Amos podcast that I co-host, is one of his most effective and definitely his most striking late career book. Um, it's the one that I think is the most successful at accomplishing what what his fictional task ended up being, the sort of task he found himself trying to accomplish in the last 15 or 20 years of his career, which is using his scabrous humor and his effectiveness at caricature to address the sort of great moral evils of the 20th century. And it's, as you say, it's, it basically has nothing to do with the movie. You know, it, the movie takes its premise, spins out from that premise. The movie takes one very notable and memorable line from the book. But other than that, the movie does not resemble the book at all, except in one very important way, which I think gets at what both of you were talking about, you found striking about the movie. Both the movie and the novel are trying to solve the problem of how do you represent the Holocaust? How do you deal with Holocaust representation fatigue? These catalog of images and horrors that those of us who are interested in culture and in history have seen and processed so many times that we run the risk of of those images themselves becoming commonplace. The trains coming into the station, the selections, the gas chambers, you know, they're horrors that we have read about and seen represented so many times that we run the risk of no longer comprehending them or being shocked by them. Amos's novel deals with that by through irreverence, through shocking humor, by almost literally rubbing our nose in the stench and disgust of what was happening in the camps. Glazer in the movie goes the exact opposite direction. He, as you guys have mentioned, he tries to remove the kind of director's intrusive vision and instead attempts to create this almost CCTV-like representation of the outside of Auschwitz to uh, make us think about the kinds of people who are perpetuating this horror. Except in one very specific section, which are these interludes of a totally different character, a young woman who lives outside the camp trying to help the prisoners who we see filmed in a totally different way through this very stylized, very subjective thermal imaging, which creates, I I would argue, a sort of third movie within this movie uh, that Isaac has already argued I think correctly is, is two movies in one. And they actually all join up in one sequence because there is a prisoner who off camera, but you can hear it is sentenced to death for eating an apple. And it's the, it's one of the apples the girl has left. But, but what you see is Haas's son playing with action figures. And then what you hear out the window is Haas saying, drown her, drown him in the river for eating an apple. You know, and so they all three come together in that one moment. It's the only moment when they all come together. All right. Well, I know we're going to pivot for the last part of our conversation to how this film has divided critics. I just want to say that I agree with you, Isaac. I think this is the movie. I well, I walked out thinking this is the movie of the year with no second. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I it's one of the few times I've sat in a relatively crowded movie theater and nobody breathed for two hours. I've never sensed a more wrapped is not the right word, but transfixed audience um, by what they were seeing. Um, It's amazing. One would almost guess that the sound designer had done what you said he or she did because of how non-didactic. At first, I thought, "Mm, this is going to, if it goes too far in that direction, it's, and it was utterly undidactic. I walked out of there thinking, out of the vast literature of the Holocaust, personally, this is my non-negotiable canon. I'm sure I'm the the really glaring, but for me personally, there's the essence of the intrusion of this evil into an otherwise civilized society is captured so beautifully in the De Sica film Garden of the Finzi Contini's, which not enough people see. It's a masterpiece of indirection too. It's about the normalcy of an aristocratic Jewish family's life leading up to the horrors. It's just an incredibly beautiful film dedicated to that that same ethic of misdirection the second is survival in auschwitz by primo levy which like if a human being doesn't read it their life is incomplete um right i think this film has that it's it's you have to somehow get it how 
Or let me get at what I think the argument about fascism of this movie is, because I think it does make one, which is that there are, are sort of two zones of interest or influence that the movie is about in some sense that define modern life pervasively. One is power in modern life is bureaucratic power. It's highly rationalized, highly divided labor. Decisions get made by committee and offices. We see some of that happen. And this is part of what Arendt was trying to get at. How does bureaucratic power, ironically enough, for lacking bloodthirst, for being cool, pragmatic, decisive, rationalized numbers on a page, turn human beings into objects to be destroyed? And the second is the bourgeois domestic sphere, the household and the home, which is by definition in modern life is isolated due to the factory and other and offices from the workplace as we know it, and therefore has a kind of highly sentimentalized innocence to it. And this movie is absolutely brilliant about how both of those things that seem so innocuous in and of themselves actually can conduce not only to evil, but evil on an unprecedented scale. And it's, it's just not overplayed. And so... I mean, we now have to get into it for for anyone to think of this as Holocaust kitsch, you know, as as Brody describes it, Richard Brody in the New Yorker. It just strikes me as insane. It's like yeah. So we should say for our listeners who want more <laughs> debate, since the three of us love the movie, there are two very high profile pans: one by Richard Brody in the New Yorker, one by Manola Dargis in the New York Times. Both of which I think are kind of wildly off base, and the rage that is underneath them is actually a sign that the movie is doing something bold and interesting. Both of them presume to lecture Jonathan Glazer on what the acceptable parameters are of making a movie about the Holocaust and what things you have to show and why, which I think is kind of shocking. And Dargis makes the bizarre claim that he spent almost a decade making this movie in this way for indie cred, which is an absurd claim given that after Under the Skin, a movie I didn't like, by the way, but that after the uh, Under the Skin, he was like the king of indie cinema and could do whatever the hell he wanted. And, and Brody is often on Twitter talked about, you know, uh, why didn't he do what Rene did in Shadows and Fog or something? And, you know, it's like, well, there's been decades and decades and decades of this imagery. You know, I, I took Glazer's project the way Dan did, that like D- Zabald in The Emigrants, he is putting that stuff off stage in order to reinvent and refresh it and reinvigorate it so that it can be considered a new and have new power. And I feel like the source of those enraged pans is how upsetting a choice that is to do. When one sees the interior of Auschwitz or its equivalent depicted... That sign, the the sign over the top. Right. Right. Uh, right. How many times do we need to see it? A, but B, it's so easy to self-congratulate, morally self-congratulate yourself. And so what you end up with, I mean, at its core, and this is what I think is both fascinating and enraging about the movie, depending on which angle you look at it from, is you end up with a movie about a woman fighting to keep her beloved home it's just that the beloved home is Auschwitz uh, and a movie about a family that is incapable of comprehending what they are culpable for. Um, and, and the only characters in the household who can truly understand what is going on are the baby who never stops crying for the entire length of the movie and the dog who can't stop snuffling around the wall because it smells something horrible and delicious on the other side. And that's like, I, that's potent and upsetting. And it doesn't surprise me that there are people who have walked out of this movie feeling enraged at what it doesn't show and people who, who like, I think the three of us have walked out of it feeling like that it doesn't show that is what makes it an incredible different way of, of looking at this experience. Yeah, beautifully said, Dan. I think we agree this is an extraordinary film, The Zone of Interest. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved for only a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why, with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, 
the bad news, SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. All right. Now is the moment in our podcast when we discuss business. We have just uh, one item of business this week, and that's to tell you about today's Slate Plus, otherwise known as Slat Plus segment. This week, we'll talk about what makes a great airplane movie. This idea was inspired by a piece in Slate from last week by the writer David Mack, who outlined his criteria for a great plane movie. We'll share our thoughts about what to watch while shooting through the air at 30,000 feet, and maybe more importantly, what not to watch. If you're a Slate Plus member, make sure to stick around for that conversation at the end of the show. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, well, we're, we're very disappointed in you. But you can rectify. You can sign up today at slate.com slash culture plus. That's slate.com slash culture plus. Members get ad-free podcasts, lots of bonus content like the Slate Plus segment I just mentioned. You're also going to hear members-only programming on other Slate shows like Slow Burn and the Political Gab Fest. Members get unlimited access to all the great writing on Slate.com. You will never hit a paywall if you're a Slate Plus member. I should also mention that you'll be supporting our work and the work of our brilliant colleagues. These memberships are, are really, really important to Slate. So please sign up today at Slate.com slash Culture Plus. Again, that's Slate.com slash Culture Plus. All right. Well, Diana Nyad was the marathon swimmer who conquered one by one some truly iconic long distance swims back in her youth, relative youth. She circled Manhattan, the English Channel, swum once from Bimini to Florida, like 100 plus miles, I think, really long distance. But she never fulfilled her lifelong dream of swimming from Cuba to Florida. The movie Nyad tells the story of her attempt to do so in her early 60s to finally realize the dream with the help of her best friend and now coach, Bonnie Stoll, played by Jodie Foster. Annette Benning stars as Diana Nyad. Nyad comes from the same team that brought us the documentary Free Solo. In the clip, you're going to hear Jodie Foster as Stoll and Annette Benning as Nyad. They're playing a game of ping pong when Diana announces a plan. So let's have a listen. I want to do it. Do what? Cuba to Florida. My swim. Huh? <laughs> you're hilarious, sir. No, I'm not kidding, Bonnie. I'm going to do it. No, I mean, that's insane. You, you, you tried that when you were 28, and you did not make it when you are 28. You're 60. Yeah, I don't believe in imposed limitations. I don't believe in any limitations. And that's the reason to do it, not the other way around. I started with 20 minutes, then 20 more, just to see. And I am up to four and five hours in the pool. I don't understand. Are you having, like, a mental breakdown or something? My mind has never been clearer. Dan, has your mind ever been clearer than uh, when you saw Nyad? What did you think of this movie? Uh, I would describe Nyad as the ideal Netflix content in that I could spend the whole movie doing something else very complicated ah. and complex and still basically get the gist of what was going on on screen in Nyad. This movie is so absurd and uh, uninteresting to me. Um, and it makes me mad in a number of different directions, which we can get at. But mostly it makes me bummed to watch Annette Benning and Jodie Foster doing perfectly good jobs with these perfectly boring, stupid roles in a movie that I hated, uh, seemingly for no good reason at all. I mean, I guess the reason is to get Oscar nominations, which they got, but for no actual cinematic purpose. Annette Benning is quite good as a, a raging asshole. Um, and Jodie Foster is quite good as like her chipper, cheerful best friend who comes to her aid when she needs her. But neither of them are interesting, nearly as interesting as they could be in other things. And, and nothing about their relationship is that interesting. And the movie itself is 
fails to wrestle really with any of the complications of this character or this feat or this actual real life complicated person who has all kinds of problems that the movie just barely touches on. Mm. Isaac, what about you? Yeah, you know, I was the one who said, hey, maybe we should watch this movie. And the reason why was not that I thought it would be great, but I know we're in the midst of Oscar season. And every year there's one of these kind of ersatz films that exists to get elder states women of Hollywood Oscar nominations. Julianne Moore was in like three of them before she finally won for Still Alice, right? That was the one she won for. And um, and so I, I had never seen any of them. And I was like, what are these movies actually like? And it turns out they're kind of like fake movies. They're like the movies that they describe in scenes in 30 Rock. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and and the thing I will say about Nyad is this. It was made by documentary filmmakers, and it felt to me like they clearly wanted to be making a documentary because they kept cutting back to real footage of these people. And the only time the movie comes alive is when they are procedurally talking about the mechanics of how you pull something like this off. And all of that stuff is fascinating. I was telling my daughter about it over dinner, like that because they can't touch her, they have to f- dump drop pasta in Diana Nyad's mouth while she floats on her back or they have to rig up this sonic shield to keep sharks away. Like all of that stuff is fascinating. There's nothing in this movie that wouldn't have been handled better by a documentary. And then in a documentary, you could also handle the controversy, which is to say there is no actual evidence she completed this swim unassisted. In fact, there's nine hours of missing records from her team. There was no independent verifier on the trip. If I remember correctly from reading the report on this and prep for today, the things I do for the arts, the swimming group whose rules they claim to have followed. There's no evidence that group exists. There's like all sorts of other weird discrepancies with this swim. And the movie only addresses it with a title card at the end that says over 40 people witnessed yeah. Diana Nyad, yeah, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, if you don't know about the controversy, you're like, when the fuck is that about? And so a documentary about the real life person, I would have been totally fascinated by, particularly by these filmmakers who did incredible work with Free Solo. I just thought this this movie was, was fraudulent in a way that as a nonfiction writer got me progressively upset as it went on. You're, you're bristling a lot today. I'm I like bristling it. a lot today. It's, it's what happens when I get a cup of the Nespresso pod here at the Slate offices yeah, before in, we start com- talking. Butler coming in hot. Yeah. Um, so the basis for a skeptical movie, documentary or, or otherwise, is implicit in this movie. You see a person who achieves a certain kind, who's damaged. The movie's, uh, no small part of the movie is about the origins of the damage, yeah. a relationship with a abusive father and an abusive coach abusive in different ways and it does admit that she's a kind of psychotic which forms the one interesting axis of the relationship upon which the relationship between her and the Jodie Foster character turns which is ordinary happiness isn't happiness to Diane and I had which is a kind of illness and the movie I think has some ambiguity or interesting nuance when it comes to that you know dialectic or whatever you want to call it that said it's not a good movie it's not even remotely a good movie it has two major problems everything else aside first is that she herself audiences have said and i agree is just unlikable uh, the character of diana nyad and secondly um the sport is itself is itself inherently boring right you're talking about a hundred hours of of repetitive motion they try so hard they They try try so hard to make it not hard and and there, there are all these little melodramatic quirks, and I don't doubt Isaac. I think you're right. The procedural aspect of just being the accompanying team and what you need to do in order to preserve the sanctity of a you know unaided swim of that length, all of it's fairly fairly interesting. I think there's an even bigger problem in this film, though, which is that okay, first of all, the Boomer soundtrack is so fucking intrusive and annoying and trite. Right. It's like chuggy in the extreme. It's like, you know, sort of it's not they don't even go deep cut Neil Young. It's like heart of gold. And, you know, it's just one after the other. And to me, this became a movie that was arguing against itself. Right. Convinced me of the opposite thing that it was trying to convince me of, which is actually having an improbable fantasy about who you might be and how you might conquer the world and then making it happen is a form of self-denying psychosis in a way. And we have a much more refined hatred of the baby boomers now than we did 10 or 15 years ago. So a movie about the very feature of their character as it has ruined our 
public world seems to me a dead end. I, I really not only didn't like the film, I didn't like what it was ultimately arguing for, which is just do it. And then, you know, a uh, small print, someone else will clean up the shit later. Right, right. Rissa Fonz's character, who plays her navigator, is dying of cancer on the final trip. And rather than spend that time with his wife, he's helping <laughs> this delusional former ABC sports anchor <laughs> swim to Florida. Right, she got a taste of fame and didn't want to give it up. That seems to me the subtext of this film. They spent like $500,000 of various corporations' money to accomplish this stupid thing over the course of four different attempts. And yes, I think the the movie, the argument I came out of this movie with is basically the same as you, Steve, that the movie demonstrates that it's a totally bad idea to devote your later years to chasing some improbable or impossible feat and then surround yourselves by people who are beholden to you to help you accomplish it. Like that is evidence that you you have not matured gracefully and need to like find a hobby. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Cause you know, Dan, I know you hated Ferrari for, you know, but another biopic that these are two biopics that use walk hard Dewey Cox story beats in Ferrari. It's uh the wrong kid died. And in this one, it's a, uh, Dewey Cox has to remember his entire life before he plays a concert or whatever that line is. Uh, but with Di Diana and I had been swimming. But at least Ferrari's like, this is a fucking crazy thing to sacrifice all of these people to. And it, it has a lot of dark ambiguity about that character. Whereas the end of Nyad is this like totally triumphalist thing where you're like, you know, they're, they're really pulling out all the stops, you know, the music swelling. It's the, it's Alexandre de, Desplat. Who's like, you know, if he's anyone can make you tear up, he's going to make you tear up, you know? So like I had was like misty eyed at the end and then also like, fuck this movie. I was so angry at being misty eyed when she stepped out of the water. I was furious at that moment. Yes. And Isaac, you, were you furious with me for making you watch it? I was it? enraged it? at you. Yes, I believe I texted you, fuck you, for making me watch this movie. <laughs> In fact, you did. You did text me that. And, uh, but you're uh, right. I was very pleased. You're right, Isaac, that there is an entire genre of, as you say, Airsats movie that it is created for the purpose of getting someone an Oscar nomination or maybe even an Oscar. And you're right that it often works. I think of it as the blue sky phenomenon named for the truly terrible 1994 drama that finally got Jessica Lang an Oscar. And, you know, it's still Alice for Julianne Moore, the reader for Kate Winslet, Judy for Renee Zellweger. Maybe this for Annette Bening definitely got her another nomination. But it was she's going to lose to Lily Gladstone. That that category is a meat grinder and only Lily Gladstone's emerging from that it. seems likely. Yes. But I but it is particularly upsetting to me this year because this year there was a movie with a actress supporting actress combination that was more artful, more interesting had better performances in both of those roles and honestly was in many ways more queer than Nyad, which was May December, a movie that actually investigates oh, yeah. the like challenging, difficult, spiky relationship between two women in a totally fascinating and entertaining way and original way and does not just hit a bunch of stupid story beats. And yet the it was like, it was too much for the Academy. Yeah, that one was top three for me. I mean, I, the sad admission here is that they got me long before she came out of the waters at Key West. It Was, was it when she swam toward the Taj Mahal? <laughs> No, no, it was uh, when Jodie Foster whistles her over to the boat and says, and she's about to poop out and she says, take off your mask and takes off the mask. Jodie Foster throws it in the water. Look over there. Look over there. Those are the lights of Key West. And I was, fuck you, <laughs> fucking got me again. Chills. All right, the movie is Nyad. About, are we in agreement about the only reason to watch it are the performances of the two leads? Yeah, it just made me wish, yeah, it, it's weird because, you know, like Jodie Foster is doing great work in True Detective, She's which you can just watch, so you just, just watch True Detective for her. I just wish people would make more good roles for Annette Bening. Yeah, agree. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you're driving, cooking, doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their Progressive Home and Auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save, too. 
Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, even hitting the home gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it. Sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverage you want like comprehensive and collision coverage, or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies, all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back when you use it to buy the new Apple Vision Pro or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Apple Card and savings by Goldman Sachs Bank USA Salt Lake City branch. Member FDIC. Terms apply. All right, a rarity for a third topic. It's uh, inspired by a listener email from Emily who says, Gerwig's Oscar nom snub for best director made her think for a second. I, she says, I realized I couldn't point to one thing in the Barbie movie that says this is where Greta Gerwig did good directing. And she goes on to say, what, what does good directing look like? What are examples of being a good director? I suspect we're all going to have our own um, opinionated, uh, highly idiosyncratic answers to this question. So let's start with yours, Isaac. Well, one of the reasons why directing is really hard to talk about, and you'll often see in reviews, they just say effective, which usually means uh, moved quickly, um, is because it's actually contextual to the project being directed. I mean, you can talk about a director's whole career and a whole sensibility and everything, but really what you have to look at is the individual project and ask yourself, what is this project doing or attempting to do? And then look at how the various components of that project go together or don't to support that, that thing. Sometimes it takes like often on a first you know, viewing, you'll just say like, Hey, that was good. Right. Probably means there's nothing wrong with the directing, but it's on reviewing that you start to examine this. It is also easier to spot when it goes awry. And I'm going to use two examples of it. One, a much derided film and one, a much loved film, uh, house of Gucci. If you watch house of Gucci, that is a movie where Ridley Scott has failed the primary task of directing, which is simply that directors make choices. That is actually all the job is, is making choices. It could be the director of photography chooses, you know, comes up with all the shots, but the director chooses them, right? And in that movie, he has made no choices. All of the actors are in different films. All of the music, all of the different design departments have not communicated with each other. So, for example, when you are in the 70s, all of the music cues are from the 80s. And then when you're in the 80s, all of the music cues are from the 70s. The Nothing nothing in that movie goes together. It has no sensibility. It's just utter chaos. And I think you can see in that what happens when a director doesn't make choices. Another example for me is actually Killers of the Flower Moon in that Martin Scorsese 
changed his mind halfway through pre-production of that film of what that film is about and who is going to be the main character and what was the story he was telling. And it just is blindingly clear that that's what happened. Every 20 to 30 minutes, it changes storytelling devices for no reason, seemingly unmotivated, and then abandons them. So, for example, there's like a 30-minute period in which there's lots of voiceover, and then there's no more voiceover in the movie. It flashes back to the same events multiple times to no end. It has like three beginnings and five endings. It's just like really a mess. And even in his larger bag year movies, uh, previously they're not messes. Like he knows what he's doing. He's conceptualized how to get from the beginning to the end of the movie in a way he just very clearly had not here. But aren't those all, that's all screen. I mean, everything you just described is a screenwriting problem. Yeah, but he wrote it as well. Right. I know. But like, but so thinking of his direction as bad then is a way of saying that he then couldn't take that screenplay, which yes, he, he wrote, which was a mess and find a visually consistent, uh, thematic way to combine those sections in a way that made you not feel the the lumps. Yes, I think that is a great point. Also, the acting performances, you know, you have a great, you have Lily Gladstone and Robert De Niro giving career, you know, probably the best late period Robert De Niro performance. Great work from Lily Gladstone. Leonardo DiCaprio is in a totally different movie. You have all these country stars who can't act giving cameos. And then you have this disastrous ending in which he's trying to problematize being a white man telling the story. And instead, he winds up sentimentalizing his own role as the director. So there's all these times where he's like trying to do things, but he winds up doing the opposite of the thing he was trying to do in these ways that 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 really stick out to me so the problem so isn't me, making I not always, making choices but making bad choices in this case and then making choices that don't make sense together mm-hmm. yes so that's making bad choices and house of gucci is making no choices to me it's easier to see what the negatives are and then you can kind of build off of that to seeing where it's like really positive and unified the ideas go together or if they don't go together it's for a, an ob- a clear reason that supports the themes of the material or whatever so that that to me is what i often think of. I start with what is this project trying to do? And then what formally is going on that either supports or does not support that thing that it is trying to do. And by trying to do, I do not mean what the director has said their goal with the pieces and interviews. I mean what you perceive from closely watching the film. Dan, tell me I'm full of shit. No, you're basically (laughs) right. I I would just say that this question is asked not only in the context of the experiential definition that you come to when watching a movie, but in the context of the Oscars, which is what does best director mean in the Oscars? Um, And it's meant different things in different eras of movie making. Um, I read a really interesting book recently that's out this month that is called Cocktails with George and Martha. It's by Philip Gefter, who's a writer for The New Yorker. And it's a history of who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, Edward Albee's play, and then the Mike Nichols film from the 60s. And the entire second half of the book chronicles the battle between Mike Nichols, who was the director of the movie, and Ernest Lehman, who was the producer at Warner Brothers, who was responsible for bringing the movie to fruition. And it's an amazing portrait of the relationship between those two roles, the producer role and the director role, which not coincidentally are the roles that the two Oscar categories reward best picture rewards producers and best director rewards a director. They're both more or less measures of was the film really good, but once upon a time, they represented very different things on who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Lehman and Nichols both have the same goal, which was to make a great movie that succeeded both artistically and at the box office. But they were nonetheless often at cross purposes throughout the making of the movie as they were jockeying for positions of power on the set and within the studio machinery. And this was at a moment when the studio system was starting to buckle under the pressure of this wave of young auteurs who had this idea that when they were directing a movie, they were the ones primarily responsible for everything it ought to accomplish. And in fact, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf would, would help further that by completely by leading the charge to change the rating system. Right, for sure. And and that was that was a battle that Nichols wanted to fight and Lehman did not want to fight and Nichols won and Lehman lost. And we're at a similar moment of transition now I think. Like these days a director more closely resembles a producer 
often than purely an old school studio director who, you know, just picks the shots and is a hired hand brought on by that by that studio. And it's interesting to see that in Oscar movies, particularly, a director is often one of the producers. Nolan is a producer. Scorsese is a producer on his movie Lanthimos, Bradley Cooper. They're all nominated for Best Picture for those movies. Some of them are also nominated for Best Director. Some of them are not. Interestingly, I think Jonathan Glazer is not a producer on The Zone of Interest, even though an enormous amount of his directing I would classify as producerial in that it deals not necessarily with a deliberate choice about the picture that's created in the moment, but about certain mechanisms by which his directorial vision can be achieved. He wasn't on the set, setting the camera in front of the actors, talking to the actors about their performances, thinking about what everything looks like in the moment. He was in a producer's role far away in like a trailer, you know, a 300 yards away from where they were actually acting, watching the results from all those hidden cameras and gauging how he might organize it differently the next day to achieve the results that the production as a whole wants to achieve. I found that really fascinating that he then did not ask for or demand a producer credit on this movie, even though I think of his direction as as much being a producer as being a director in the way that we often think about it. A lot of thoughts. I mean, one is that there are miraculous powers of concision with visual storytelling using a camera. And editing allows for a different kind of flow of time than a play does, for example. And um, so you can condense time and violate chronology and do all kinds of things in order to tell the story as you as you choose faces convey enormous amounts of emotional information you don't need a ton of words all of which is to say with visual storytelling even in a four-hour spectacle less is more in some sense not to the academy no (laughs) no that's true but a director a director ha- has to be a master of concision yeah. in some sense. They have to understand that they are telling a story with a camera in some sense. And some directors don't even seem to, you know, uh, clear that particular hurdle. I think there have always been a couple of interesting problems about applying a kind of metaphor to filmmaking of the author, the individual author. It's a kind of hopelessly collaborative and chaotic medium. A lot happens on the fly multiple, multiple multitudes of people, each of whom considers him or herself an individual artist, um, come together to make it. So I lo- I do like that standard very much of coherence. I mean, somebody is going to be the power center and the principle of coherence and the decider. And I agree with Dan that in the history of film, it is obviously a mostly a jockeying process, yeah. a competition between producers and directors. Director was often a hireling for a lot of the golden age of Hollywood. But the second thing I would say is that coherence is a good way of judging an individual film, right? Whether it works or fails, and then trying to assign responsibility to producer or director, depending on how it was made. But what I would say is that the whole idea of the director as an author is a holistic concept that the Cahiers de Cinema critics derived from looking at bodies of work by way of trying to understand what otherwise disparate films had in common when they all shared the name of a single director. From that, they got a visual style, a sensibility, and were able to literally make the founding arguments, I mean, based on what, I guess, Andre Breton, if I remember correctly, had already argued a little bit, but they developed it much, much further. And so the whole convention of like having a film festival in which you watch all of you know, Hitchcock films, right? I mean, that derives entirely out of a a set of preoccupations born in the 1950s in Paris. And it's not the most natural thing in the world. And so it's always going to be a set of highly complex negotiations that go not only into who makes the choice in a particular film project, but how it gets interpreted after the fact as being the responsibility of a single person, which means Dan is wrong, right? (laughs) But when Martin Scorsese is the director of the film, he can fire the screenwriter midstream. He can hire another one. He can get a, he can hire a punch up, a joke guy, uh, a rewrite artist. That was Scorsese's to decide. And was, he was not at all beholden to this, to the movie on the page, not in the least. I thought what Dan was saying, this is my middle child here trying to make peace, but I thought what Dan was saying was that, that the actual failures of, of the director are the failures to fix the problems, which are a failure, which are a failure of the director. Right. But every specific failure Isaac itemized was a structural failure of the screenplay. 
And Scorsese's failure, according to Isaac, was his inability to overcome those screenplay failures to create something coherent on the screen. But he's the he's not only the director, he's Martin Scorsese, he's a national treasure. He is effectively the producer of the film. He get Marty gets what Marty wants at this uh, he, point. He's in a career, name especially because this is a this is a and, and screen, right? And this is a valedictory effort by an American great. If he looks at that script and thinks, I want to shoot this movie, that's on him. At that point, if he looks at the movie and says, these things are incoherent, I need a month of rewrites, then that's also on him. But at no point does it not become a Martin Scorsese movie. I want to address the letter writer's specific question, which is, what is it in Barbie that suggests that Greta Gerwig is a good director? And so I want to use maybe both your definitions to throw out my thoughts, and I want your thoughts. If we're judging on coherence, right, on executing a vision for a movie in a coherent way that propels you through it, Barbie definitely accomplishes that. Like it's got a visual, auditory, and acting plan that are all in complete sync. And it's clearly her vision. I guess maybe sort of also Noah Baumbach's, but it's her vision for what that movie should look, sound, feel like, and how it should be paced and how all the performances should affect you. That is. It, it, I can't think, in fact, of a movie that is has a more coherent vision that was released this year. If you look at it in, in Steve's definition as what does it tell you when you look at Gerwig's entire career about if you look at all her movies side by side, what commonalities do they evince? You can draw a straight line from Lady Bird to Little Women to Barbie and the different ways that they explore women's experiences and put them on screen in ways that that don't ignore the power of pop and um, the power of sort of flippancy and fluidity in those experiences. And so to me, that's the argument for her as a really good director. That's different than the argument for her as best director at the Oscars, which mostly just means most director. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think actually the big issues with Barbie are writing issues. They're not directing issues. And so it's interesting to me that it's nominated for screenplay and not nominated for director. I think you're right, Dan, that it's a, uh, I think Zone of Interest is as if not more unified, but it is a totally unified thing in which all of the formal properties are going to support what it is trying to to do. The fact that one of the things that it is trying to do is make it okay for feminists to buy their daughters a Mattel toy, I think is part of the problem. But that's not a directorial problem. That's like an underlying problem of the whole project. Do you know what I mean? And that's a political problem. That's not even necessarily a screenplay problem. Do you know what I mean? That's an ideological issue. So 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 I I, I agree with what you're saying there. We gotta wrap it there. But uh, very curious to hear what uh, listeners think um, constitutes good directing and our various pet theories. All right, let's move on. Now is the moment in our podcast when we endorse. Isaac, uh, let's start with you. What do you have? Okay. I have one, uh, a movie that I think is exquisitely well-directed, I guess, uh, 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 from 2015. It's streaming on the Criterion channel right now. It's is Jacques Odiard's film, Deepon. Uh, I've been thinking about it a lot lately and, and rewatched it recently because of the, 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 the so-called kind of made-up border crisis that we have right now. Deepon is a movie about three Tamil refugees from the Civil War in Sri Lanka who assume fake identities and pretend to be a family, a mother, a father, and a daughter by taking deceased people's passports so that they can get into Europe. So they go to France and they settle in France as a ersatz family and they're complete strangers. But the place where the French government settles them is a housing project in which there is a brewing and escalating gang war around them. And it is unbelievably beautifully directed, incredibly unsentimental about the characters, whereas I feel like a lot of films about (laughs) immigrants and refugees are very sentimental and idealizing about these people. These are people who have been through traumatic experiences and who are really struggling. And and it's just, it's a really, really incredible, incredible, powerful film. I will also say, second second endorsement, if you've seen a Zone of Interest or if you're sort of interested in this project of keeping the, the Holocaust off stage to see what else can be revealed, I really highly recommend you read the W.G. Zabald book, The Emigrants, which is a portrait of four different German emigres. The book is entirely about the Holocaust. The Holocaust is never mentioned in the book 
once, I think. Someone can fact check me on that. And it's it, it's sort of magical in a dark magic way what this mo- what this book kind of does by tracing a circle around this black hole of the of of the Shoah. Uh, it's a, it's an incredible book. It's not a fun book, but it's an incredible book. Those so those are my two endorsements for our listeners today. I'm finally going to subscribe to the Criterion Channel, and I'm finally going to read Zabal. Do it, buddy. I, I've been dilatory on both counts. Dan, what do you have? Uh, I'm endorsing something extremely different, uh, a little bit lighter. If you are in New York City or going to New York City soon and you enjoy laughing your ass off, uh, I'm going to endorse that you go to Cole Escola's show, Oh Mary, at the Lortel in the West Village. Um, you may know Cole Escola from Search Party or Difficult People. You may not know them at all, uh, but they wrote this play. They also portray Mary Todd Lincoln in this play as an alcoholic, man-crazy, sociopathic cabaret star. It is extremely stupid and funny, and I recommend it. I recommend having one and a half cocktails and going to see this show. Uh, there's a great interview with Cole Escola that Ruman Alam did in the first season of Working. We should put that on the uh, show page if you want to learn more about how they make their work. All right. I'm endorsing an essay in the London Review of Books by Rebecca Solnit, probably most famous. She should be famous for many things, but most famous for coining mansplaining. Um, her essay is called In the Shadow of Silicon Valley. There's a lot of uh, weird right-wing mythology now surrounding San Francisco and the state of the city as a city, uh, depicting it as a kind of near-apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic, you know, hellhole courtesy of, you know, um, meddling liberal governance. She sets out to set the record straight in a highly personalized way. She's essentially from San Francisco, has lived there on and off for the better part of 40 years. What I love about this piece is it is the perfect combination of methodical, cool, no zeal, never break a sweat, counterpoint by counterpoint rebuttal of this bizarre, you know, uh, right wing counter history about what's happened to San Francisco. And then, of course, reverses it and says a serious part of the responsibility for the problem San Francisco is facing right now emanates from the very people spinning out this myth. But it's a it, it it combines that cool, pragmatic, rationalized approach with a visionary moral zeal to see the essential loneliness and impulse towards secession, that wealth of the kind that Zuckerberg, Thiel, and uh, Elon Musk have, the desire to both kind of remake society while also withdrawing from it and all of its demands. She, she gets at that so beautifully in the course of it without ever overwriting or screaming jacuz it's really it's an amazing essay all right it's called in the shadow of silicon valley and it's by rebecca solnit in the london review books highly recommended dan thanks so much for coming on the show thanks gents isaac really fun as always it's always great to be back and uh, i'm i'm just excited because i'm sure dan has written another book over the course of this taping so <laughs> it's a novella I, love it. Guys. I didn't want to show off all right well you'll find links to some of the things we talked about today at our show page that's slate.com slash culture fest and you can email us at culturefest at slate.com our introductory music is by the composer nicholas Bertel. our producers this week are cameron drews and jared downing our production assistant is kat hong For Isaac Butler and Dan Coyce, I'm Stephen Metcalf. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you soon. This show is brought to you by Discover. You know, in today's world, it seems the best treatment is reserved for only a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why, with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, We've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.